Welcome, church. We are so excited you are here with us tonight. Welcome to our online viewers as well. We have some announcements. We have several announcements tonight. All right, first one. Uh, welcome back, Dwayne. We are so happy you are here. We are, you're such a blessing to us. Uh, we are so excited to worship with you tonight. Um, thank you to everyone who came out to the Silvas for movie night. It was great. We're going to do it again. Thank you to the Silvas for hosting us. Um, it was just a really fun time, so I hope we do it again really soon. We have Heartline this Thursday, the 24th at 7 at Suzanne's house. We have our very first praise and prayer night uh, here in this building, the Launch Point building. This Tuesday, the 22nd at 7 p.m., invite your friends, your family, your coworkers, anybody who just needs to get fed, anybody who needs prayer, healing, just invite them to come. It's a great time to just come and really try out a church, too, because praise and worship is just a huge part of church. And so just invite everybody you can. We have dinner with Danny tonight at Shoney's right after church. We have the back room from 7 to 9, uh, so we will need help cleaning up and packing up so we can get over there to dinner. So if some of you can help us so we can get that done quickly, that would be amazing. Then t-shirts. We have extra t-shirts in the back. Uh, they're $10. Um, we have the logo shirt and the onion shirt uh, on the back table in the lobby. We have only a few sizes, so first come, first serve. So let us know quickly um, after service. And then our boxes to my left, your right, the praise and prayer box and our tithes, offerings, and donations box. We don't pass that around. We just want you to be led by the Holy Spirit. So let's pray, and then we will start worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you for everything you are doing, Lord. We thank you for dying on the cross for all of mankind, Lord. We thank you for your blood that covers us, Father. You who knew no sin died for our sins, Father. You became sin for us. A love like that is hard to comprehend, but if we could understand your ways and your thoughts, then you wouldn't be God. Lord, I pray you cover Dwayne during worship. Um, while he leads us in worship, while he uses the gifts that you've given him, Father, I pray you cover Pastor Danny while he teaches us your word. I pray our eyes, ears, and hearts just stay open and focused. I pray against any spirits of hindrance or um, distraction, Father, tonight in the name of Jesus. I pray you just bless worship. You bless the word tonight, Father, and you bless the congregation here tonight, Father. We love you. Thank you so much. In Jesus' mighty, my matchless name. Amen. Come on, stand up. We 
will sing, sing, sing. And make music with the heavens. We will sing, sing, sing. Grateful that you hear us when we shout your praise. Lift high the name of Jesus. We will sing, 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 and make music with the heavens. We will sing, sing, sing. Grateful that you hear us when we shout your praise. Lift how the name, oh yes, we shout your praise. Lift how the name, oh yes, we shout your praise. Lift high the name of Jesus. Would you begin to clap your hands and begin to thank the Lord that he inhabits our praises? Isn't that cool? That all we got to do is say, hey, Jesus, we worship you, we praise you, we thank you, and all of a sudden, boom, he's here. So I'm going to explain the story. If any of y'all watched the video Danny and I did and why I cracked up. Well, two stories, but that, that, that one was. I'm sorry, just when he said, Badur, it um, just cracked me up. And, I, and I, my, 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 my sense of humor, just, it just went. And, uh, uh, but yeah, so, uh, and then the, the holy cow part. Um, man, I don't know. Is anybody besides me just their week has been challenging? Okay, three, four of us. That was like last time I was here. I was like, any of you having a good time? Three of you. Three of me. Okay. So the rest of you just ignore what I just had to say. The rest of I'm telling you, this past week has been insane. And uh, But here's what I know about what the Lord does is that he knows what the enemy's been up to. Well, let me ask you, any of you had any distractions this week? Okay, just three. Okay. Anybody lied this week? Oh, we got one. There we go. Okay. Anybody? Not, no, I won't do that now. Um, but the enemy does. Like, he likes to come in and just, just mess with us and, and distract us from the main thing. And the main thing is when we come in here today and we begin to worship the Lord, watch what he does. Because there's nothing that the enemy can do to us that God can't overcome. Do you all believe that? Would you just by faith right now, just close your eyes. Father, we worship you. Clap your hands, praise, and begin to say the name of Jesus. Father, we worship you. We thank you that you're here. We thank you that you didn't leave us alone. You didn't leave us alone in our sin. You didn't leave us alone in our circumstances and your situations. But, God, you partnered with us. You sent your son for us. Seated above, throned in the Father's love, destined to die, poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. Never sinned, but suffered as if he did. All authority, every victory is yours. All authority.
Ah! 
Is, I know it's a struggle for you, a, a, a lot of us, and not just when they're really raise their hands with me where, you know, we fall short or whatever it is, but I love how the Lord, it, it reminds me of when Peter had gone back to fishing. He had, he had walked with Jesus for three years. He, he denied he knew Jesus, and he went back to doing what he used to do. And Jesus approaches him, and, I, and, and he says, do you love me? Three times, do you love me? Third time, do you love me? Peter's like, Lord, you know I do. And I believe in that moment, just my opinion is that the Lord wanted Peter to know that he loved him. Because I think he doubted it. He was ashamed. Lord, we just thank you for your love. I thank you for this atmosphere and this place tonight in your presence. You may be here tonight and there's just something in you that you, whether your week's been a struggle or life's been a struggle, And you're sort of at that campfire, campfire like Peter was and just alone feeling unashamed or you just, or maybe you just, you, you want to get a little bit closer to the Lord and you know that sometimes your heart and your mind gets in the way. Begin to sing this. Rain in me, Lord. Rain in me. Take all that I am. Take all I am, Lord. Rain in me. Rain in me, Lord. Rain.
my life. Take my life and reign in me. Reign in me. One more time, hallelujah. raise your hands to the Lord. Yeah. Would you just allow that presence of the Lord just to just seep in, embrace you, love on you, fill you with his spirit. If you're empty, would you just ask the Lord to fill you completely full right now, completely full. You don't have to be empty. You don't have to leave out of here empty. <laughs> you can go away with, you can be full right now in the name of Jesus. Right where you are, would you just put your hand over your heart? Father, I pray that as 
as Danny becomes, comes up here to give his message, Lord, that that place, and, I, and this is my prayer and your prayer, that our hearts would be open, our mind would be open, that our hearts are full, our spirit is full, your presence has filled us up. Lord, let us go out here, not just hearers of your word, but yes, doers. that's right. Where you are right now in the presence of God, where the where by the power of the blood of Jesus that your sins have been washed away. Some of you need to hear it tonight. I don't know who it is, but you need to know that you're pure in his presence. Because you have not felt pure. You felt impure. And I'm telling you, whoever that is, that is not, that's not from the Lord. The enemy has lied to you. And I believe the Lord wants to tell you, do not call impure what I have cleansed. You know the moment where God cleansed you from all unrighteousness. You were there. And God's telling you right now, don't call what I have called clean impure. Oh, we thank you for that. We thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yeah. Woo. Good stuff. Man, I feel the Holy Spirit up in here. Thanks, Dwayne, for praying us in. How's everybody doing? Good. You guys excited about tonight's message? Yes. That's a correct answer. <laughs> we finally finished our series on Ephesians. Um, and I love Ephesians. Was that not awesome or what? Yeah. Oh, I love God's Word. I love God's Word. So we're transitioning from that over to parables. I mentioned that last week. Um, one of the craziest things you can do is tell God your plans. <laughs> oh, boy. That's what I did. I said, Lord, uh, I feel a green light to, to move into... Uh, Teaching about parables. And he said, yeah, I gave you the green light on that. I said, cool. So I started working on it, and he took me down a whole different bunny trail. And uh, I learned when God starts uh, leading me down a, a road to just obey, because he is up to something. Well, he is up to something tonight. I'm going to start off with a story. When I was in my early 20s, I went to this mega church, and they had uh, karate classes. And there was this sensei that uh, he just was passionate about karate, and uh, he just felt led to start a class. So me and some of my uh, buddies were all single dudes. We're like, you know what? It'd be macho to learn karate. So we, we <laughs> this is funny. Let me go back on it. We had fun. It was fun. It was, uh, there was a, he turned it into a ministry. Good fellowship time is awesome. All that to say, he says, uh, my, our sensei told us that his sensei was out of Charlotte, North Carolina. I think it was Charlotte. And uh, that he had taught a 17-year-old teenager who was the current karate national champion. Oh, he was bad. So our sensei called his sensei and said, Hey, can you bring that guy down here to this church to do a, a demonstration and, and inspire these, these, this group of wannabe karate dudes, which included me. So he brought it, this guy down. And so I had, I was living with a, a, another guy. We were roommates. We were both drummers. We were both on the worship team. It just was a perfect situation. We had extra rooms. And whenever somebody would come visit, they would call us and say, hey, can you put this missionary up or this visitor up in your house? And we loved it because we loved the fellowship. We loved to, you know, it was just fun. So yeah, this, this karate guru dude can hang out with us. He's, he's a kid. He's 17. So he shows up, and our sensei decided to take us all out to the beach. We lived in Charleston, South Carolina, and the ocean was literally just 20 minutes away. And he was going to do this demonstration in the evening time out on the beach. 
And so we went all out there in our karate uniforms and, you know, plopped down in the sand. And, and he got out there and he had this thing called a bow. Well, for you non-karate people, it's a stick, a big stick. And he started his demonstration and we all, we all noticed two things instantly. <laughs> we had way underestimated a 17-year-old kid because he just became a blur on the ocean. He spun that bow so fast and twirled it as he did his karate moves. You could not see the bow. It became invisible. Maybe the slightest of a blur. The second thing we noticed was how fast he was with his technique. It was all inspiring. Jaws dropped. <laughs> Our sensei looked at us and grinned like, told you so. <laughs> like, oh my goodness, this guy was amazing. I remember afterwards, <laughs> he was staying with us, you know, so we kind of had a little extra front row seat since he was our guest at the house and all. And we were talking to him afterwards about his speed and fluidity. And uh, he said, well, not to show off, but to demonstrate, uh, how about you, you, you show me a, a karate punch, Danny? <laughs> I got this. So I get my little stance and I go, wait, right? <laughs> That's about how I, I could go with it. And he just laughs. He goes, okay, good, good, good form. He said, now try to do it as fast as you can. I said, well, all right. Now, yeah, that was, you know, just warming up. So I go, wait, real fast, right? He goes, okay, awesome. He goes, now I'm going to stand next to you. And he goes, I'm going to count to three. And when I say the word three, you throw a punch. I said, yeah, gotcha. And he's right next to me. He goes, all right, ready? One, two, three. And when he said three, I did one. He did four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. To my one. I, and it was just a blur. I was just like, dude, do that again. And he had this thing. His gi was uh, heavily starched. And when he would punch and come back, it would snap into the, the material. Pow! pow. <laughs> it was just amazing. So when he did the one, two, three, four, it was like, pow, 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 pow. Not just be the one, pow, pow. <laughs> and it didn't even do the pow. So <laughs> that's an example. So I say all that to say this. We were back at the house later that night, of course, after some good pizza. And uh, we're just hanging out with this guy, talking. We're very fascinated with this guy. And so he's 17 years old, and he shared this story that recently happened that week. Since he was a, the champion, he had this jacket that on the back that said National Champion and had some kind of karate logo on it, and then his name under it. He said, uh, and he had it. He said, wearing this jacket has gotten me into some trouble. I said, well, how's that? And he said, well, just this week, he was a senior in high school. He was uh, walking through the halls. And he goes, there's this one section of the halls at lunchtime, the football team, half of them line up on one side of the hall, the others on the other side, and they call it the, the, the push line. And if you have the uh, bravery to walk through it, they push you back and forth and you, you pay for it. You know, and, and everybody avoids it. You know? And he was like, well, I'm not going to avoid it because I'm, you know, I'm just not. He goes, I walk through it. And he goes, right when I walk through it, he goes, the biggest football player, the biggest, strongest dude steps out in front of me and says, you think you're all big and bad because of that jacket? And he says, I don't think I'm big and bad. He was very humble. He said, I don't think I'm big and bad about anything. I'm just a champion. <laughs> it is what it is. And the guy says, well, what if I was to kick your tail right now? And he just stood there and he goes, excuse me? He goes, I think I could fight you right now in front of all my buddies here and take you out. And you know, he did a big muscle. He's a big football player. And he says, with all due respect, when you're out chasing girls and when you're in your hot rod car dragging main, when you're playing video games, I'm in the gym training for hours and hours and hours and hours. <laughs> he goes, I lift weights and I punch a bag for hours and hours and hours. When you're goofing off, I'm training. He goes, so does common sense tell you you think you really could beat me in a fight? <laughs> he said, the guy kind of swallowed hard, thought about it for a minute, looked at his buddies and goes, oh, you make a good point. 
I don't think I could win. And he said, wisest choice you've ever made. And he walked through the line and nobody touched him. <laughs> Why do I bring that up? Because when you're a champion like that, even if you look at like Olympians, uh, anybody who's won a championship, there's so much work that goes on behind the scenes. There's so much repetition, muscle memory, uh, work that goes into it. Well, I thought of that analogy because it's the same when we study the Word of God. When you get in this book and read it and read it and read it and read it and read it, when the enemy shows up and tries to, to uh, throw you a curveball in life or just outright try to beat you up, try to fight you, whatever, <laughs> you, it, when you stand on the mighty Word of God and you go, can I ask you a question? <laughs> I know my identity. I have the power and authority of Jesus Christ. You really think you're going to win? <laughs> Probably not. You resist the devil, he flees. Amen? Mm. Mm -mm -mm. When we put on the whole armor of God, like I preached last week, uh, we have pieces that we put on. Almost all those pieces are for defense except for the very last piece, which is what? The Word of God, the two-edged sword. Mm -mm -mm. Here's what it says in my prayer. I tell you, I showed you last week, I'll show you again. I have the, the, the whole armor of God prayer right there. I said it this morning. I opened this book. I say it out loud because words have power. I want the enemy to know I'm, I'm locked and loaded with the whole armor of God, including my two-edged sword. Here's what it says at the very end of that prayer. It says, I take up the sword of the Spirit. May the two-edged sword of your word be ready in my hands so I can expose the tempting words of Satan. Those key word right there is the tempting. There's the fight. There's the battle. And if you aren't well-versed in his word, if you don't take your sword and practice with it and work out with it and, 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 and do it over and over and over and over and create this muscle memory, oh, you can be a grand champion of the Lord with this two-edged sword. It's an amazing, amazing weapon. Oh. If we are not trained up in God's word, we'll be easy prey for the enemy. I say that to say this. The Bible is the living word of God. It is alive. It is like a holy onion full of layers. That's why I love to say peeling the onion. It has layers upon layers upon layers upon layers. Ask me how I know. This week in my office, thank you, I hung out with God as I often do when I get down on my my church office is in the basement of my house right now. One day it'll be in our church building, amen. But right now it's at my house. And uh, in my basement, I, I, I always tell everybody, my basement is haunted. It's haunted with the Holy Ghost, amen. <laughs> I love it. I need to put a sign up. When you walk downstairs, you see that sign. Basement haunted by the Holy Ghost. But I know I get down there. It's become a, 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 a secret place, a safe place, a, a place where I talk to God, I hear from God. Uh, it's really become an amazing kingdom space, if you will. So I was hanging out with God, uh, which is how I came up with today's message. Today's message is pretty unique. Very unique, in fact. Um, like I said a while ago, I think it makes God laugh when we tell him our plans. And uh, this week, I told him my plans. He laughed and said, here, hold my wine. And then he proceeds direct those plans and then shows me his plan and <laughs> i've learned to obey like i mentioned earlier all right lord what are you up to so my intention you probably heard me say this last week i said man ephesians was full of kind of stepping on your toes and it's a bunch of uh it, it was Paul talking to the church and, and letting the church know what it looks like to be a Christian. And, and there was some, some tough stuff in there and all that. And I said, I look forward to parables because parables are more lighthearted and directed towards the unbelievers. And God just laughed and said, that's cute. Do you think that? I said, well, that's how I've always read them and interpreted them. And what are you talking about, Lord? 
The Lord told me that teaching his parables was still on the menu, but I needed to teach them in context. Then he reminded me of Matthew 10, 34 through 39. Watch this. This is Jesus speaking. Do not think I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Ouch. Why'd you take me there, Lord? He says, keep reading. Verse 35 says, For I have come to set man against his father, daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemy will be those of his own household. Boy, I could preach. (laughs) He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Ouch! And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Oh, man, I know a lot of parents who make their children their idol. That's a whole different message. 38. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Oh, true words. True words. The more I die to myself the more God reveals himself and his plans and his ways to me. But there's an exchange. So as I preach today, (laughs) if I step on your toes, then I'm missed because I'm aiming for your heart. I'm aiming for your heart. Today's message is more about parables in general with a parable at the end. Moving forward, the lessons will be about parables in particular from uh, week to week. But I felt it was apropos to share what God has shown me this week. So buckle up. So let's talk about parables. Mm. There's a lot of poor, careless, sloppy teachings and preachings of parables in the American church today. And I think it's important for us to understand parables, like I said, in context. So as I like to do, what's the definition of a parable? A parable is an earthly story that illustrates a heavenly truth. I'll say that again. A parable is an earthly story that illustrates a heavenly truth. In the Bible... Jesus teaches his disciples and followers by using parables, among other methods. Parables were a way to convey moral, transcendent principles with an allegoric story that people could understand and relate to. That's why I love to tell stories. It makes things applicable. How do I apply this to my life? What does this look like in my life? I kind of got that from Jesus, in case you didn't know. It was a teaching method using familiar To illustrate unfamiliar. That's what parables are. Teaching a method using familiar to illustrate unfamiliar. Parables can be one-liners. Such as, you are the salt of the earth. From Matthew 5.13. Or, do not cast your pearls before swine. That's in Matthew 7.6. Parables can also represent a picture within a story. This type is called a simple parable. And examples are the lost sheep and lost coin in Luke 15, 3 through 10. Another type is a narrative parable. This is a dramatic story with one or more scenes as displayed in the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, 30 through 37. Through the parables from Christ, we can learn the importance of accountability for our thoughts, our actions, and our motives. Parables can be awesome. Parables can also be seen as metaphors. This is important. Just, no, Jesus' narrative parables are probably best understood as extended metaphors. The story or image is a window through which a larger reality is depicted. Understanding the message of a parable is more than identifying its point. Though many parables do, parables do have a focal point, it is reinforced by the parable as a whole. Jesus was the master of the short story. Jesus was making a point when telling parables. 
The purpose of the parable was more about the listener or hearer than it was about the story. Did you catch that? It's more about the person out there than the actual story. When interpreting a parable, we should look for the overall story and not expository details. Parables are always about the big picture. The Lord gave this to me and I wrote this down. This is, I'm not this smart, but I have written in my notes. Parables are not the word of God. They are words from God. There's a big difference. Let me put it this way. A parable is a story to be heard. It is not a manuscript to be studied. That's what the word of God is for. By hearing the story, we can discern the punchline of the story more easily. We should avoid adding meanings to details which are provided to accentuate the point the storyteller is making. Parables were Jesus' way of calling people to concrete situations rather than to abstract concepts. Jesus was interested in teaching people about real life, not just a bunch of religious rules. So, as I studied this in depth, this is one of those weeks where I just read and read and read, researched, 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 because as God was moving on my heart, I'm always looking to make sure that, I'm, first of all, I'm hearing correctly. I owe everything I hear, I, I, I read the Word of God to make sure it doesn't contradict. Uh, that's how I know I'm hearing from the Lord and not a bad burrito from Taco Bell. So I'm sitting there hanging out with God, and as I'm researching, studying things, he starts pouring this kind of detailed theology stuff into me, and I'm writing them down. So the first two years of Jesus' ministry, he taught in an expository fashion, uh, teaching the scrolls, teaching uh, just the old, uh, what we call the Old Testament stuff, because that's all they had at that time. Um, he was unpacking God's truths. And it wasn't until the end of his second year and going into the beginning of his third year that the ministry of Jesus began to shift. There was a, a shift from expository teaching over to parables. And ultimately, it was the teaching of parables that led Jesus to be crucified. That was kind of an aha moment for me. See, at this point, Jesus' ministry, two years in, he was very famous. And multitudes of people followed him everywhere. You'd think that Jesus would be excited about that, but instead, watch this. This hit me. He grew tired of their motives and disobedience. You're like, what? For two years, he spent his time preaching and teaching and could see that the multitudes were not following him for his profound teachings. They followed him so they could be entertained by his miracles of multiplying food and healings and so on and so on. That offended him. So Jesus being a genius and a bit annoyed, if I'm being honest, changed things up going into his third year of ministry by introducing parables. I thought that was very interesting when I put all that together. Jesus used parables as conviction, as well as a method of separation. He knew these stories would have a way of separating people. He was going to separate true believers from the wannabes. He was going to separate the righteous from the unrighteous. Why would he do that? Oh, because I already told you. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. <laughs> Oh, I'm starting to look at these parables in a whole new light. God said, good. That's what I'm wanting. All of that, by the way, was the intro to the message. <laughs> Great. Hopefully we'll make it to Shoney's tonight. Turning your Bibles to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Mm -mm -mm. As usual, I'm reading from my new King James Version. It's my jam. Matthew 13, we're going to be starting right off verse 1. I've got to warn you, there's going to be some bouncing around. And sorry, not sorry. 
Who in here has the New King James Version? Holly, what are the very first four words? On the same day. Say that real loud. On the same day. I could just stop right there and teach a whole message. In fact, a lot of this message is going to be about those four words. Do you guys know what an amazing day this particular day was? It was huge. It was the day of all days. The first four words right out of the gate on the same day. This day is an absolute epic day in history and in Jesus' ministry. You're like, whoa, you got my attention now. Good. This day is like no other day. I can't emphasize this enough. This is a day in which a dramatic transformation takes place. A shift happens. A supernatural shift takes place on this day. Things that happen on this day are ominous. They are abrupt. They are startling. And it's a shocking day in of itself, just by itself. Just the events that take place on this day would be enough to set it apart. But there is a turning point in the entire ministry of Jesus on this day. Mm -hmm. On top of all that, it happens to be a Sabbath day. Near the end of Jesus' second year of ministry, like I said before. On this epic day, it is approximately a year from his crucifixion. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together to him. So that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables. That caught my attention. Just so you know, from this day forward, whenever Jesus spoke in public, he spoke in parables. First two years was one way of preaching. Third year, he's changing things up because I'm done with it. We're going to parables. This is a huge shift. Up until this day, Jesus never spoke in parables. There were no parables in the Sermon on the Mount, for example. And this is a monumental change that everyone experiences on this Sabbath day. Why did Jesus launch this new style of storytelling? And why <laughs> on the Sabbath? Oh, I'm glad you asked. So I got to give you a bunny trail warning. We're, we're going off, off the, the course here. You need to know uh, more about the Sabbath day in case, you, in case you don't know. Let me tell you about what God's law was meant to be for the Sabbath. This can be a little complicated, but it's important that we get this. God's law for the Sabbath was simple. Worship, do not work, get some rest, period. <laughs> Pretty simple. Worship, don't work, get some rest, period. That was it. There was nothing more. Pretty simple stuff. Anything and everything that has been added to that is man-made garbage. <laughs> and Jesus knew it. In fact, it kind of ticked him off. God's law was for rest. <laughs> so you don't work. Take a day off. Praise the Lord. That was what the Sabbath was about. According to Isaiah 58, verse 13, the Sabbath was intended for a day of rest, watch this, and a day of delight. A day of delight. <laughs> Some people may take delight in going fishing. You know, you can fish and talk to God. Hang out with God. That's in Isaiah 58. It was intended for a day of rest and a day of delight. If you read through your Bible, you'll see how Israel ran amok, and after they were given the law of God, they virtually disobeyed it for centuries. They didn't rest, and certainly did not delight in the Lord. They didn't use it as a day of worship. <laughs> they broke the Sabbath. They broke the Sabbath year. They literally broke Sabbath in every way. So eventually, 
The rabbis became concerned about the violations and disobedience of the Sabbath. So, in turn, they wanted to protect the Sabbath, and in doing so, covered the Sabbath with endless rules. So the pendulum swung drastically from one way, way over to the other way. Which led to a big word called legalism. That is why I am so anti-legalistic. Oh, it drives me bonkers. People want to complicate the, the good news. They want to complicate the gospel. That's, that's satanic. It's simple. It's simple. No longer was the Sabbath about worship, delight, and a day off work. It was about rules and regulations. Now, the Sabbath was about a massive set of laws not to be broken at any cost. So here's the deal with that. By the time Jesus arrives on the scene, the Sabbath is the most dreaded day of the week. Everybody hated it. What was meant to be a day for the Lord, a day for delight, now people just hated it. They just dreaded it. Because it was smothered in rules and laws. The fact is the whole uh, self-righteous legal system found its identity in this newly established Sabbath. Why do I mention all of this about the Sabbath? Because Jesus absolutely loved to, vi to violate this man-made distorted Sabbath that the religious crowd had embraced. He was there to wreck the world. Why would Jesus rebel against the Sabbath? The answer is because the Sabbath no longer represented what it was established for. And also, also because the new Sabbath was rooted in control and pride. Hmm. There was a spirit behind it. Now Jesus was going to use parables to wreck their world and their misguided mindset of what the Sabbath really was. I love Jesus. <laughs> He's awesome. So let's do some RSE. That's my, my thing I invented called reverse scriptural engineering. It's where we turn back just to bring the, into context what we're reading about. And in this case, we're in Matthew 13. We're going to back up to the previous chapter, to chapter 12. And there's a reason. Because those first four words in 13 says, on the same day. Well, guess what? There's a lot of things that happened earlier in that same day, and we're going to cover that in chapter 12. This was an epic day. This is a very, very busy, phenomenal day, by the way. So if you're in Matthew 12, we're going to start at verse 1. And it'll lead us back to 13. At that time, in other words, on this day, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. This is how we know it's a Sabbath day. And his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, uh, you know, I read that like, wait a minute. <laughs> They're on a field <laughs> eating. How could the Pharisees see that? Because they were among the multitudes that stalked them everywhere they went. Everywhere they would go would just be these crowds of multitudes because they didn't know when a miracle was going to happen. They didn't know when, when they were going to multiply fish and bread or whatever and get fed. They were just hanging out. They wanted to be entertained. You don't want to miss this. So likewise, <laughs> they're like, hey, wait a minute. What are you guys doing? And he said to him, says, look, you, your disciples are, going, are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. There's that legalism again. <coughs> there isn't a single Old Testament law, by the way, about this. Zero, divine commandment in the scrolls. This was 100% purely and simple because of the man-made traditions that they, not God, had developed to replace the original law of God. Verse 3, But he, that's a capital H, Jesus, Jesus said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him? See, Jesus knew they were privy to the Old Testament scrolls, so he uses it against them. This is genius. <laughs> I love it. In verse 4, he said how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread 
which was not lawful, he reminded them of that, for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. <laughs> They're sitting there, these Pharisees, legalistic dudes just scratching their head on this one. Then he continues, or have you not read? <laughs> Let me keep going. <laughs> no wonder they didn't like Jesus. Let me keep going. In the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless. Yet I say to you that in this place, watch this, there is one greater than the temple. (laughs) Mind blown. But if you had known what this means, then Jesus gives a quote. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Then Jesus continues, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Then, in order to drive his point home, (laughs) Jesus says something that will stress them out to the max. In verse 8, it says, For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. I bet some of them fainted on the spot. (laughs) (laughs) What? Oh, for the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. In other words, don't tell me what to do. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I will decide what I want to do on the Sabbath. This had to rock their religious worlds. Verse 9. Now when he had departed from there, watch this, he went into their synagogue. I love that. You know, he could have just went, you know, let's go into the town square and hang out and do a little preaching, throw out some more parables, whatever, what he's about to do, right? But no, <laughs> he said, I'm going to go into their synagogue. Talk about turning the knife. Verse 10, watch this. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. Of course Jesus knew this was going to happen. And they asked him, <laughs> saying, mm, Oh, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? That they might accuse him. (laughs) Then Jesus said to them, (laughs) What man is there among you who has one sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out. Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful... To do good on the Sabbath. Jesus was calling them out for being hypocrites in front of everyone in the synagogue. I have to believe that there were some people sitting there that dreaded the Sabbath, that didn't like the Pharisees, but was loving this new rebellious guy named Jesus, and they wanted to high five each other, but they couldn't because the Pharisees are there. But they're like going, Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and Jesus probably looks over and just gives them a wink. I got this. I just see this stuff in my head. Verse 13. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. Remember, he said, don't tell me what to do on the Sabbath. Mm. They said, uh, isn't this unlawful? Uh, don't care. Lift out your hand. Boom. This guy stretches out his hand. It says, and he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Jesus blatantly rebels against their man-made Sabbath by breaking their rules right under their snooty noses. He's doing all of this on purpose. All of it is on purpose. Verse 14, watch what happens. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him. Watch this. How they might destroy him. I told you this is an epic Epic day. There's a shift that takes place. On this amazing day, this day is the first step towards the cross. And Jesus knows it. He knows it. Ooh. And he uses it. He starts it out on the Sabbath. They wanted to kill a man for healing another man on the Sabbath. This is how twisted their theology had become. Mm. After this, there's more. After this, Jesus knew he had stirred up a hornet's nest and he took off. Then after that, soon after that, he was approached by a demon-possessed blind mute. 
and he healed him. Yet another miraculous healing on their precious Sabbath day. Of course, you know, Pharisees were in the crowd watching this, this rebellion, this disobedient to their law, only angering them even more. When the Pharisees saw this healing, they claimed that Jesus was demonic. Oh. Jesus rebukes them, of course, making them even more angry at him. Here they are witnessing Jesus, the Son of God, before their very eyes and were clueless of the Savior standing in the very midst. Wow, how blind were they? I, I saw a meme a while back said, you know, Jesus is performing miracles and he's doing a deliverance on this guy full of demons. The demons know who the Son of God is. All the Pharisees, the religious ones around him, are clueless of the man of God standing in their midst. The demons knew, Pharisees didn't. Wow. Oh, that's good. In Matthew 12, 31 and 32, don't turn there, I'll just say, I'll just, this same chapter leading up to the Matthew 13. But in verse 31 and 32 of chapter 12, it says, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. This is a big deal here. In verse 32 it says, Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. Hmm, okay. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or the age to come. Well, here's the deal with that. The Pharisees blasphemed the Holy Spirit when they claimed that the things Jesus had done was from hell. Mm. Anyone that claims such a thing is beyond the point of salvation. Down in verse 37, it says, For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Oh, how many times have I said words have power? There is power of life and death in the tongue, amen? Mm. Holy condemnation fell on the religious crowd on the Sabbath day. And the day wasn't over yet. We're still on that same day. This day is also paralleled over in the book of Mark. And if you read over there, there's an account that we see Jesus deals with yet another possessed maniac that lives in caves and runs around naked and is inhabited by a legion of demons. Sounds like Broadway downtown. Which Jesus casts out into a herd of pigs, which run off a cliff and into a sea. Watch this. The multitude saw all of this on this epic day and were amazed. Jesus, Jesus noticed that they were entertained by his deeds, which ushers in the need for parables in his ministry. I am so going somewhere with all of this. Now we return back to our original text in chapter 13, verse 1. On the same day. <laughs> there's a lot going on that day, isn't there? It's been a busy, busy day. I'm tired and I wasn't even there. <laughs> Amen. What an amazing day. Now that when we say on the same day, now you know what I'm talking about. You see all the things that happen. All that you got to realize by the time they get to this point here, verse 1 of chapter 13, the Pharisees are just in a really bad mood. They're very angry. They're plotting on how to kill this guy. It's just they have stirred up a hornet's nest. There's rumors going around. The people are talking in the multitudes. Who is this guy? What is going on? <laughs> so Jesus enters here in chapter 13, verse 1 and says, you know what? That's it. I've had it. I'm starting a new ministry, and it's called a parable ministry. And that's where we are. Verse 1, on the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together to him, which included Pharisees and all these legalistic creeps. So that he got into a boat and sat. I've talked about that before. When you're on a boat and you're near water, it works as an uh, amplification like a microphone I had a friend that lived on a lake, <laughs> way across on the other side of the lake. At night, people would be out on the dock to be talking, and you could hear their conversation. You couldn't barely see the dock, 
But you can hear the conversation like they're sitting 15 feet from you. I'm like, oh boy, I sure hope they're not telling any secrets over there because we'll all know about it. But man, the water amplifies sound in an amazing way. Jesus knew that. And when he wanted to speak to the multitude, he didn't have a microphone. He'd get in a boat and let the water expand his voice. So he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Verse 3, then he spoke many things to them in parables. That means there was a whole lot of parables spoke that day. A whole lot. He just started right there. Are you ready? (laughs) Parable, 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 parable. And we now enter into Jesus' parable ministry. Jesus tells a story about four kinds of people that can be found in this massive gathering. This becomes personal now in the place of his typical blanket teachings. See, before, the first two years, he'd get up and he would teach about scrolls. There'd be these blanket teachings that everybody could listen to. Now in these parables, he's talking about you. He's talking about you. He's talking about you. And the Pharisees over here, it became very personal. (laughs) What's very purposeful. Mm. Jesus says to the crowd, Behold, a sower went out to sow. So many parables were spoke that day, but this one made it into the Bible. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. Mm. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they were withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Verse 9 says something very interesting. He who has ears to hear, let them hear. Y'all have a good night. Jesus walks off. (laughs) I love how he ends this thing. Those of you who have ears to hear, I hope you heard what I was saying. And just walks off. Which had to have everybody going, what, what just happened? I, what, was he talking about you? I think he's talking about you. I don't know about that. Right? <laughs> so here's one of the epiphanies I had this week. <clears throat> this was big. This was big. I'm going out on a limb saying this. But I'm being obedient. If you pay close attention as you read all the parables, and there's over 40 of them, they have a tone to them. A tone of judgment. A tone of conviction. Even a tone of annoyance. And a tone of condemnation. This is on purpose. When the Lord revealed that to me this week, I'm like, Wait a minute now. I thought these were sweet stories. That, you know, to, to, you're kind of dumbing things down so these lost people can, can hear and, and all that. He goes, no. No. At this point, Jesus is frustrated. For two years, he's been preaching and preaching and preaching and, and, and expository preaching and, 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 and uh, peeling the onion for these people. Two years. And the same group is walking around and he doesn't see any growth, any new commitment. He, he, just, if anything, they just want to be entertained. I'd be offended by that too. He's like, you're wasting my time. And my time here on earth is short. So I went ahead and read, I'd say, out of the 40 parables, I read 25 of them. And with this mindset, everyone had that tone. And I'm like, wow, I'm onto something here. This, I, this is new. This is a revelation to me. God's like, good, because nobody's teaching this told you if he tells me to do it i'll obey (laughs) so here we go this was on purpose jesus does not want fans he wants followers he does not want fans you guys i've mentioned that book one of my new favorite books called not a fan and uh when i first it's a good title because it caught my attention what do you mean not a fan i'm not a fan of jesus what do you mean not a fan of Jesus? I'm offended. Now I read this. Jesus doesn't want fans. He wants followers. There's a complete difference. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. I'm a follower. Count me in. Jesus knew where all this was headed. 
Jesus gave his all for us up on that cross. Nothing less than our all is suitable for Christ. That's why he's annoyed at this crowd. He, he was like, you guys are clueless to what I'm about to go through for every one of you. And I'm willing to do it. I love every single one of you. But you know what? I got to tighten things up. I'm going to start throwing out some parables. I, it's time to step on some toes. I want to talk about you, 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 and you, and you. <laughs> oh, ouch. Like I've said before, fans go to a game as spectators. They're there to watch and be entertained. Sound familiar? They are at the game, but not in the game. Fans annoy Jesus, just to let you know. And quite honestly, they disgust Jesus, just so you know. You know why? How I know that? Because it says, when you're lukewarm, I want to spit you out. And the spectators are lukewarm folks. They're at the game. They're not in the game. Mm. Hope you see where I'm going with that. If you're going to claim to be a Christian, then you need to be a follower, not a fan. Jesus expects believers to wear the uniform, to be in the game, serving, sweating, putting in the work. I am not talking about salvation. I'm talking about after you've accepted Christ into your life. I'm talking about kingdom service and kingdom obedience. Because scripture says faith without works is dead. You might as well be a spectator doing nothing, eating your popcorn and your drinks and, and cotton candy, going up here, throw me one, and, 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 and just having all this fun uh, uh, entertainment going on while the game's going on down there. That's where Jesus and his disciples are. And he's looking at the crowd going, hello, hello, multitude, multitude. What does football stadiums hold these days? 60, 70, 80,000? Whew. <laughs> Spectators, I need more of you down here on the field. He's had it. The multitudes that followed Jesus were mostly fans and not followers. And Jesus was aware of this. This is all explained in the next section, starting in verse 10. And the disciples came to him. All right. Remember he, he, how he ended the, the last parable? Mic drop, they walk off. So here's what I envision. <laughs> this isn't biblical. This is Danny Bean. I envision them later at the camp. They got a fire going. They're hungry. It's been a long day. A real long day. <laughs> Jesus is wore out. And then they're grilling whatever. <laughs> There's some mumbling going on. And Jesus is like, what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> and so the disciples are discussing things. And it talks about this right here. This, I just imagine them around a campfire being dudes. And the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? <laughs> And like, this is something new. For two years now, we've been following this guy, and he's been preaching the scrolls and, and expository and, and peeling the onion. <laughs> Jesus, what was today about? All these story things. And Jesus said to them, watch this, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Ooh. But to them, it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. That's how the Satan works. That's how, that's how the enemy works. In verse 13, it says, Therefore I speak to them in parables. I tell them stories. Because seeing, they do not see. Ouch! And hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. For two years, I've been trying to get through their thick skulls, and they don't understand it. They're not seeing it. They're not getting it. They're not hearing it. So now I'm doing parables. <laughs> I bet you can hear a pin drop around that campfire. Ooh. See, the disciples have been blessed because they do have eyes that see and ears that can hear. Because they are followers, not fans. Hmm. Oh, I'm going somewhere with this. I feel the Holy Spirit talking to me right now. I just got this right now. When you're a spectator, 
You don't know the game plan down on the field. Only the players get around the coach at, ti at, at timeout, and the coach has a, a playbook. And he's showing them the play. Here's the play. We're going to run this play. We're going to go. There's an enemy out there that, that's ugly, and he's got this, these red horns, and this. he's nasty. He's the devil. We're going to go kick his butt. But here's what we're going to do. But here, here's the deal. The, the spectators, they can't see that playbook. They're just up here. I wonder what they're doing. I wonder what's going to happen, whatever. They don't have eyes to see the playbook. They don't have ears to hear the coach's plan. But the players who have the uniform on the field, they do. Amen? Oh, I got goosebumps. <laughs> mm. I'm so far off my notes, I got to catch up here. Hold on. See, they are followers, not fans, because they gave up their careers. They sold their possessions. Uh, when Jesus asked them to go on this radical mission trip, they are all in. So when you're a follower, oh, they get eyes to see. They have ears to hear. They have minds to understand. It. They get it. It's like this supernatural elevation they get for their obedience. You, you get to see the playbook. You just do. They don't. They don't. They wish they did. They don't have eyes to see, ears to hear. They don't even understand what's going on down here on the field. They're just at the game. And that bothers Jesus. Verse 14 says, and in them, that's the fans, the spectators, the multitudes, in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, watch how awesome this is. He's recanting a, uh, recalling a, a, a prophecy. It says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Mm. And seeing you will see and not perceive. For their hearts of this people have grown dull, which means lukewarm. Those are the spectators. It says their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes have closed. Until, you guys have another word, <clears throat> but I changed it in mind to until because the same thing. Until they see with their eyes and hear with their ears. And until they understand with their hearts and turn... Those two words are super important. Then I will heal them. Mm. Verse 16, but. I love when he throws a but in there. <laughs> but means instead of, in place of. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly, I say to you, that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see. And did not see and hear what you have heard and did not hear it. Mm. So, let's go over the four kinds of people explained in this parable. We all know somebody that fits into one of these categories. Do not be nudging your spouses. <laughs> Please. <laughs> that sounds like you, honey. <laughs> You're number two. <laughs> Don't do that. 18. Therefore, hear. Mm. In other words, listen up. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. So Jesus is like, okay, gang. <laughs> like I said, I imagine around a campfire. He just said what he said. How blessed they are. They have eyes to see and ears to hear that the spectators don't have. I have a, a pretty good feeling you could hear a pin drop. It was quiet. Jesus had their full attention. And he says, okay. Bring it in. I'm going to explain this. This is awesome. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. Listen up. Lean in. Verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, that's what he's been doing for two years, preaching and preaching and preaching and traveling and traveling and preaching and preaching. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. Mm. We all know that person who has been exposed to the gospel and refuses to accept it. Because Satan plants unbelief and doubt in their minds. They think you're crazy for believing in the invisible guy in the sky. They think the Bible's full of fairy tales, which has floods and dudes that get swallowed up by fish. And they think we're nuts for believing it all. <laughs> I know because I have a friend just like this. 
He is so close-minded about the Bible. It's just written by men. And all the translations have been twisted over years. I wouldn't believe a word in that book. I'm like, brother, this is an infallible word of God. This thing's alive. It speaks to me. It talks to me. Hallelujah. He says, well, you, you be you. That's how he said it. You be you. <laughs> I will be me. <laughs> Thank you for giving me that permission. But he's, oh, he's just like this. Oh. The enemy studies us. And he knows us. He knows what to use against us. If you're an over-analytical person, the enemy will use that against you and cause you to see most spiritual things as loony. It takes faith to be a Christian, which means believing in things that are not as though they were. Amen? Amen. Mm, come on. Second kind of person Jesus is speaking to, verse 20. But he who received the seed on stony places... This is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a little while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Dwayne, can you come on up? I shared this story before, but I'm going to share it again because it's so perfect right here. When uh, my buddy Clay and I, we were roommates in this house. We called it the drummer house. And uh, we, we were real active in our church. We had uh, multiple, multiple small groups at the house because we were just on fire for God. One night we had uh, 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 singles, boys and girls, a uh, Bible group. Another uh, group we had was for single men. And it was a Promise Keepers. You guys remember Promise Keepers back in the 90s? Big thing, a conference in Phillip football stadiums. And so we'd go to these conferences, get all fired up, go home, start a small group, and, and use some of the curriculum and just, you know, do guy stuff. Well, one day, this uh, guy brought a friend of his from work. The guy was lost. He just got out of rehab. He was kind of a hot mess. But he told him about Jesus at the job site. And the guy's like, just, you know, okay. He's kind of like processing it and drinking it up as the guy's witnessing to him. So he says, hey, we got this group that we meet on Thursday nights of just guys. You should come with me and, and hang out. And, and, you know, he's trying to introduce him to the Lord. So the guy said, okay, I need as much help as I can get because my life's not going very well. He showed up. We prayed over, loved on him, all that kind of stuff. And he said for the first time he felt accepted by people that wasn't in the drug and alcohol world party world and I think it was like a month later we had uh, had already booked a uh, promise keeper event in Knoxville Tennessee I was living in Charleston South Carolina I was excited about the conference but I was just excited about the University of Tennessee football stadium anyway so we invited this guy we offered to pay his way I think it was if I remember correctly $140 a person that was bus trip the conference and a hotel room he said, yeah, because this thing was, I don't have money. Well, we got you covered. So that wasn't an excuse. All that to say, we got him to the stadium, and I loved Promise Keepers because they had the best of the best of the best speakers. Oh, man. I mean, they would just melt your face with the, with the Word of God. It was glorious. And the worship, oh, the music was this awesome. Well, this guy, he went with us. <laughs> And it was a two-day event. On that second day, that guy is jumping, crying, praising the Lord. We're crying. We're like, man, we're seeing the move of God on this, this dude. And he's going up front. He went up front multiple times. I think he got saved three different times. <laughs> if they were doing baptism, he probably would have got baptized. But here's the sad part. And he fits in with this group. We went back home. We were all excited. I mean, on the bus ride home, he had so many questions. We were like... <laughs> We've done kingdom work. We got somebody. The kingdom has grown. This one guy. Hallelujah. We got back home. It was time for the next promise keeper guys meeting. And he wasn't there. And his friend was so discouraged because he worked with him. We're like, we're such and such. He goes, man, I got bad news. He goes, he came back all excited about God. And he was living in this place. And he was renting a room full of all these people who were doing drugs and alcohol. And within two days, he was back smoking dope, getting drunk. And we haven't even seen him at work. I mean, he was so mountaintop experience, so on fire for God at this conference, so glorious, and just so, 
I mean, it was beautiful. And then he gets home, and Satan shows up and just pounced on him. And he, he wasn't armored up. He, he, he didn't have what it takes to fight the enemy, and he fell right back into it. Mm. He's the second guy. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a little while. For when tribulation or persecution arises, and it did for this poor fellow, because of the word, uh, immediately he stumbles. I have never forgot about that guy. I have prayed and prayed and prayed for that guy. I prayed, God, just please reveal yourself. He, the seeds were planted. I saw it. Lord, please, please. At the, he, when he's at the end of his rope, maybe in the next rehab, whatever, Lord, remind him of this awesome time that we had in Knoxville, Tennessee. We move on to the third person Jesus speaks about in verse 22. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Jesus is talking about the double-minded man unstable in all his ways. He has one foot in the church and one foot in the world. Jesus says this person is unfruitful. Obviously, because he's unstable in all of his ways. How can he be fruitful? A tree that is unfruitful is useless. Oh, that fell in my spirit. I'm like, Lord, that's, <laughs> that's a little tough. Isn't that a little abrasive? No. <laughs> a tree that's unfruitful is useless. Why? Because it's not fulfilling the purpose in which it was created. Oh. Our God's a creator. He creates things for a purpose. It can't feed anyone. What good is it? And then I was reminded of the fig tree that didn't have any figs on it. And Jesus was hungry. So Jesus spoke a word curse over it. And it immediately withered up and died. This shows us how disgusted Jesus was with some of these people. Some of you beautiful trees out there, but you're not bearing a single thing of fruit. You're useless. Useless. Finally, we come upon the fourth person in the parable. Verse 23. But he who receives seed on the good ground, hallelujah, is he who hears the word, understands it, which means follow the word, walk in the word, obey the word, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. Let's back up though. Bears fruit and produces. I always say there's a difference between bearing fruit and producing fruit. A lot of people think it's the same thing. No. Bearing something is carrying the weight of it. Oh. See, and if you start having good fruit, the Lord will prune you so you'll bear much fruit. In other words, you'll have so much fruit, it's heavy, but it comes over time. So your strength, your limbs are strengthened. You can carry all that fruit. You can bear the weight. Then it says, produce good fruit. Oh, that's good. Jesus is emphasizing when you're planted in rich, healthy soil, there will be multiplication. There will be a, an abundant harvest. Ooh. The very first parable written in Scripture is no accident. Jesus told many parables that day, but this one was chosen to be recorded. On this epic day, on this Sabbath day, Jesus did not bring peace. He brought a sword, and it was called a parable. He divided. He convicted. He indicted. He took the first step towards the cross on this day. Maybe I should have titled this message on this day. Instead, it's, why did Jesus use parables? I hope I've painted a picture of the reason and the purpose for parables. And touched on some things here with the sower. And uh, 
the Lord has already shown me my next three weeks of parables. Ooh, and it's going to be glorious. It's, it's, it's profound. It's amazing. I can't wait. So let's all strive to be that fourth person. The person planted in rich, fertilized soil, watered by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so we may grow up in Christ and the ways of Christ. So we can bear and produce much fruit. So we can be blessings to everyone around us. Amen. Lord, Father God, we just thank you. Woo! Oh, thank you, Lord. What an amazing, amazing message that you brought, Father God. It's convicting. It's eye-opening. It's uh, full of epiphanies and aha moments. I love that, though, Lord. Lord, I, I pray for conviction. Because we won't grow until we know what we need to work on. So show us areas in our life. I love to say, put a Holy Spirit spotlight in areas in our life that we might not even be unaware of. Maybe some unforgiveness. Maybe there's some bitterness we need to deal with. When we deal with these convictions, when we repent, we're taking next steps, Father God. That's what this is all about. It's about drawing closer to you. Discovering you in new ways. I love it. I love that the Bible's the living word. <laughs> I am proof of it. All the time you're peeling the onion. There's just another layer and then another layer and then another layer. I love it. I, I, it strengthens my faith. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray for everybody in this room tonight. Continue to grow all of us. Continue to shape us. Pour your Holy Spirit water all over us. Plant us in rich soil mm. so we can grow and thrive in you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this message. Thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for Dwayne being here from South Carolina and leading us in worship. Hallelujah. Uh, what a glorious, glorious uh, time of church tonight with our brothers and sisters in this church family and the body of Christ. My heart is full. I'm smiling ear to ear. I love you, Lord. I love what you're doing. And it's all for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Woo! Oh, he gets the applause. He gets the applause. Hallelujah. I, I, I knew it was going to be a little bit of a a weird message on parables. It uh, went down a direction that I never intended on doing. I'm glad you uh, are here. I'm excited about the uh, afterwards, going out to dinner all together. We did this once before. We had pizza with a pastor, and the whole place showed up, and the pizza place was loving it. It was great. And so we hadn't done that in a while. We're like, you know what? Let's do this. Let's get together. Let's go eat. Uh, they have a buffet, and it's glorious. Ask me how I know. And so... Come hang out. I hope every single one of you come and hang out with us and uh, just spend some time breaking bread together and fellowshipping and, and, and just being a family. Amen? That's what this is about. This is about being a family. And it also gives you opportunity to hang out with Dwayne and get to know him better. And I think that's important. And uh, yeah, so God bless and you're dismissed. If you can help clean up afterwards, do that. And awesome. <coughs> Tuesday. <coughs> oh, let me talk about Tuesday real quick. I am super, super excited about Tuesday. I'm sorry I didn't mention Tuesday because I'm already thinking about the buffet. Anyway, I'm being honest. <coughs> Tuesday. I really, man, I pray that everybody in this room is here 